Okay, recording this video after close of trade Thursday, 10th of March 2011, and I know we had a huge day in the market today, but uh, I don't particularly want to talk about that. I want to talk about a response I got uh, by email to uh, the post I put up yesterday, uh, in which I uh, included a video by Richard Koo, the economist, talking about uh, his view that we should have more government deficit spending in order to pull us out of a recession. And uh, Mario uh, sent me this email, which uh, clearly we had kind of a, an email backwards and forwards the, this morning, and he's clearly extremely you know, well-read and knows his stuff. Uh, I think we just have a slight um, kind of difference of opinion. He kind of tends to support uh, Richard Koo's uh, view, and I really don't. Um, in the emails that we kind of exchanged backwards and forwards, he kind of suggested that I thought we were on the road to hyperinflation. I do want to clear that up. I don't believe we're heading for hyperinflation, but let me see if I can explain what I think about kind of the current situation. And this is purely just a rant. You know, no one knows the future. Uh, some people hold strong opinions. I, ho I, I think I do. Uh, but really, at the end of the, the day, you know, no one does know the future. And I'll try and lay out, you know, kind of the reasons why I hold my particular opinion. But really, please don't care very much about this video. It's just one of these personal rants and has nothing to do with trading and certainly not kind of the short to medium term uh, in terms of the market. The first point I want to make is who put the government in charge of the economy? I mean, when I was a kid, I remember listening to, you know, discussions in the UK, you know, to the Houses of Parliament, you know, talking about what was going on and the state of the country, certainly. But since I was a kid, the government has basically taken on responsibility for the economy, which I think is bizarre. I believe the job of the government and politicians is not to manage the economy. Their job is to put the elements in place so that people can lead productive lives. And so that's a combination of things like, first of all, security and safety. We need a military focused on the de defensive, and we need a police force to look after the citizens. We need laws and regulations uh, to ensure that we're all playing fair and by the same rules. We also need kind of uh, to organize for the common good. So things like infrastructure where you know, there are massive kind of uh, decisions that need to be made for the good of the citizens. We need that kind of coordinated by the government, setting standards in terms of you know, putting in motorways, putting in high speed internet connections and so on. And then we need a safety net for people who are less fortunate, who do fall through the cracks and who aren't so capable. But then after that, the government's job ends and it's up to you and me to be productive citizens and us being productive is called the economy. The second point I want to make is if I blow up my trading capital that is my problem and banks are just like me. Banks are businesses they're like me they take risks and from time to time they take excessive risk and they blow themselves up. I've done it a couple of times the banks have just done it on a massive scale but it's not the job of the government to bail them out with taxpayer money. The government has two responsibilities in the form of government policy, the Fed and the FDIC. First of all, they have to ensure that ordinary depositors get their money back. And I'm not talking about you know, high interest earning deposit accounts that like, similar to what we saw in the ITSAVE accounts uh, in the UK and the Netherlands. I'm talking about ordinary, regular accounts where depositors thought that they were taking zero risk and just were getting the minimum interest that the bank would pay them. That money has to be repaid back to them. They are not complicit in the banks taking risks and so they should not pay for it. And then secondly, you know, we do have these crises from time to time and so there needs to be a lender of last resort and whether that's, you know, the government or the Fed, uh, but we need someone to kind of step in in the short term sometimes when there's a complete loss of confidence in order to bring some confidence to the market uh, and to allow lending to continue. We don't want runs on banks and we want short term losses of confidence uh, to have a flaw under them. But apart from that, banks are no more special than you or me. They are not a special part of the economy. They are business people. They take risks. Sometimes those risks don't pay out. They don't deserve special attention and they don't deserve to be bailed out. The third point is, every 70 years or so, we all go nuts. We have debt bubbles every 70 years. And that's just long enough to be outside of living memory because once you've been through one of these debt bubbles, you don't make that mistake again. 
Let me tell you a story about my grandmother. My grandmother was born in 1900, and she was born in a place in the northeast of England called Tyneside, which was where all the ships were built at the turn of the century in the UK. Hugely productive part of the economy. The Depression comes along, and it's the equivalent of Detroit right now. The economy falls apart, and they had what was uh, called at the time a famous event called the Jarrow March, where unemployed workers walked from the northeast of England to Parliament in London to lobby their case uh, for support in some way. Now that hugely affected her psychologically as a, gr a young adult. She ended up marrying a civil servant, my grandfather, who had a very steady job. They paid cash for their house. They would never dream of getting into debt. Her brother uh, became a fascist and a member of Oswald Molesley's Black Shirts Party. That's how deeply affected he was. He became extremely politically active as a reaction to what happened in the economy. And once you go through one of these debt bubbles, it severely affects you, the way you think about the world and the way you approach the world. And for her, it was one of safety. Do not get into debt. Have a safe, civil servant, government paying job. Pay cash for everything. And this 70-year period is important, kind of being in living memory. I believe it's the job of historians to remind us about these historical events. So people like Neil Ferguson, who's kind of, you know, the economist de jour at the moment. Ken Rogoff, who's the economist uh, in Harvard, who has uh, done a lot of, you know, work with Carmen Reinhardt on uh, This Time It's Different, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly. All of those works and the, uh, the analysis, the historical perspective that those people bring to the situations helps to remind us of what is out of living memory. I believe where we are today is much more like the Great Crash of 29 and the post-Civil War boom in the US that led to a prolonged depression in the uh, 1860s and 1870s. This is not, in my opinion, like 1973 or 87 or 91 or 2000. This is different. We're at the end of a super cycle in debt creation and, and we've got a debt bubble that is bursting at the moment. And debt bubbles, when you look historically, do not end in hyperinflation. They end in deflation and depression. And I think that's what we're going through. The next point to make is what is the role of government, in my opinion, after we've all gone nuts? Well, the first thing is the job of government is not to keep the party going. You don't stimulate the economy with de deficit spending after a debt collapse. So I disagree with Richard Koo that that's what we need to do right now. And I think the jury's out whether it's been a success in Japan or not. We're not going to know for another 10, 20 years whether we can call Japan a success. But I don't believe it's the job of the government to spend taxpayers' money to deficit spend to keep the party going. The second point is it's not the government to regulate to save us from ourselves. These are things that are part of human nature. They happen on a regular basis. Now, I think there are some exceptions. Credit default swaps were a disaster. If you're going to write that kind of bet, you need to have capital to back your bet. You can't write, as AIG did, literally tens, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of paper against things that could happen if you don't have the capital to back it up. If you're a bookie, if you run a casino in Vegas, if you're an insurance company, the government stipulates that you need to have capital to back up your bets because you're going to get it wrong from time to time. So CDS is one case, yes, we need to regulate those. I think a lot of derivatives ought to be in an exchange so, so we can see exactly what the position is because at the moment what we have is people writing bets without capital to back them up. But apart from that, the got job of government is not to re-regulate after we've all gone nuts. It's human nature to do that. We do it with food, we do it with alcohol, we do it with drugs, we do it with violence, we do it with wars. It's just part of human nature. It won't go away. And kind of cotton balling us after we've done this will do no good at all. It's the job of the citizens, the people now, us, to put our houses back in order. And that means we need to work hard, we need to innovate, we need to create, and we need to toughen up. And I've talked about this before. You need to toughen up and you need to start working hard. We're in this situation because we've got fat, dumb, and happy, and we're soft right now. So the only way we're going to get through this is to toughen up and work hard. 
and I mean that working hard when it comes to trading. It's like you need to work hard at your trading, whatever your job is, however you earn a living. It's like there's not going to be an asset bubble there that's going to save you this time around. There's not going to be easy money in terms of jobs, pensions, and salaries and bonuses. You're going to have to toughen up and you're going to have to work for it for a change. And then next, the Fed is acting like it can control and manage the economy. I believe the job of the Fed is limited. It's to issue currency, it's to ensure the commercial banks follow the banking regulations, and then when problems do arise, it's to resolve insolvent banks and to return the deposits to the savers, as the FDIC should be doing. The market set, can set interest rates. We don't need the Fed doing that. The market can do that perfectly well. The problem we have with the Fed is when you start growing the money supply greater than natural GDP growth, currency starts to be devalued. It's just a question of the number of dollars out there versus the core economic growth that is being created. The currency, as I see it, has been devalued since the Fed was started and certainly in the last cycle of debt growth since 79. By the currency being devalued, it discourages savers and therefore capital formation and also hurts people like retirees and people on fixed income who should be earning a higher rate of interest. It encourages debt growth and Ponzi finance growth and excess risk taking. As a result the citizens become poorer. So I don't believe this argument that says you know it's just money on a balance sheet it doesn't matter that the government can pay off its debt it's kind of netted off by you know the Fed assets and so on. That's not the point. We shouldn't be growing the money supply greater than GDP. It just devalues the currency over the longer term. And over the longer term, citizens become poorer. When you look at citizens, their wealth, what they can buy in terms of the purchasing power of imports, you know, the purchasing power of assets, stores of wealth like gold, Swiss dollar, and even things like the Aussie dollar, where a, a stronger economy and got into less debt and less mint money printing. Okay, so just as a last thought, whenever I see Ben Bernanke up, you know, giving his testimony on Capitol Hill, I always have this flashback of Jurassic Park, and let me explain. Ben Bernanke is Richard Attenborough, who's playing, you know, John Hammond, who is the creator of Jurassic Park. You know, you have that kind of classic scene where they're flying over with the helicopter over the ocean, you see that fabulous island, which happens to be shot in Kauai here, where I'm uh, sitting at the moment in Hawaii. You know, he's so proud of himself, of what he's been able to create. He's taken the, the DNA that's been frozen in amber of uh, dinosaurs, and he's cloned dinosaurs, but he's been so smart because he said, you know, he wants to prevent uncontrolled breeding by just having females. And then Joff Goldblum, who comes along, he's Dr. Ian Malcolm, and he's the chaos expert. And you have this scene where the scientist Wu says to him, you're implying that a group composed entirely of female animals will breed. And Jeff Goldblum says, no, I'm simply saying that life finds a way. You know, just because you think you're smarter than everybody else, Mother Nature is much smarter than you. And she comes along and finds a way that the dinosaurs can breed. And they get the DNA from frogs. And frogs can jump from, male, uh, from females to male when they need to breed and the dinosaurs start breeding on their own. And so this, you know, guy who thinks he's so smart at the head of the table, Richard Attenborough, you know, the creator of Jurassic Park, you know, thinks he's so smart creating these dinosaurs that can't breed and he's in control and he's in charge of the whole thing and it goes disastrously wrong. I just look at Ben Bernanke and I see Richard Attenborough and Jurassic Park and I think this guy is an academic, he thinks he's so smart, he controls all the levers in the economy and the world economy, and I just think you're not that smart to fool Mother Nature, to be really in control of the economy and humans and what they're doing around the world in their economic interactions. So there we go. Had to get that off my chest. Little rant. Hope you enjoyed it. It's just an opinion.